Hi, and welcome back. So time for my three monthly update. This time I'm gonna cover the results for November and December 2023 and January of 2024. And that marks the 57th month point of my longevity experiment. I'm gonna compare this data with all the recorded data that I've gathered since 2019. First of all, let's jump in and let's take a look at my subjective stats. Let's start by taking a look at the supplements I was taking over the last three months. First of all, we've got 1.5 grams of NMN, nicotinamide mononucleotide, one gram of trans resveratrol, again, only on the days I don't weight train, which is on a Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday. 1,000 milligrams or one gram of metformin split into two doses. 1.5 grams of TMG, trimethylglycine. 5,000 international units of vitamin D3. 120 micrograms of of vitamin K2, and that's the MK7 version, 250 milligrams of magnesium, L3 and 8 version, 400 milligrams of hyaluronic acid, high molecular weight hyaluronic acid, 2.4 grams of fisetin, and that's on the first, second, and third of each month, and 2.4 grams of quercetin, again, on the first, second, and third of each month. And if you want to know why I take it in these big doses at the beginning and not every day, there's a link in my subscription stack in the description below to why I do that. Cert6 activator, 400 milligrams per day. DIM, 600 milligrams per day. And glycine or glynac, which is um, NAC and glycine, 800 milligrams per day. Now, the majority of the supplements I take between six and 6.15, just before I walk the dog every morning, I'm usually on the road by about 6.15. Um, my DIM is split into three doses, 200 milligrams in the morning when I just if I walk the dog and all the other supplements I take as well. And then I've got my alarm set for 11.30 in the morning and I take another 200 milligrams sometime between 11 and 12 in the morning. And the last 200 milligrams I take with the second 500 milligram dose of metformin just before I go to bed. That's now changed to slightly between 9.30 and 10 o'clock in the morning. Um, and remember, as I said, I take my resveratrol on the days I don't weight train. I train Monday, Wednesday, Friday. So I take those Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, and I mix that into my yogurt. Diet and fasting. Let's first of all look at my fasting protocol. On non-OMAD days, that's one meal a day, um, I'm on the 16-8 protocol. So I'll finish eating at 8 p.m. the night before, and I won't eat then again until about noon the next day. But I'm still trying to push that to two, three, four o'clock in the afternoon. I'm trying to make every day an OMAD day. On OMAD days, which is Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. So for example, on a Sunday night, I'll finish eating at 8 p.m. and I won't start to eat again and again on Monday until 6 p.m. I tried to do the full 24 hours, but I found myself rushing to eat and now give myself a two hour eating window to get all the calories and the nutrients in that I need. Um, all I consume during the day on OMAD days is black coffee, water, and sometimes the odd cup of chamomile tea. Moving on to diet, lunch. So there's no lunch on OMAD days. I eat my resveratrol uh, at 8 p.m. So breaking my fast in the afternoon, if I need to, I eat nuts. But as I've said, I've tried to push that further away. I don't snack anymore, but if there is something to eat during the afternoon, either on the OMAD day or on the non-OMAD day, I'm looking at chamomile tea, as I said, or decaf coffee, this time with a drop of heavy cream in it. Dinner, so now there's a lot more chicken than there used to be beef before. I do sometimes eat beef. We found a good place where we can get ground beef. So burgers, uh, cheeseburgers are back on the menu in the evenings. Sometimes cruciferous vegetables, although not all the time, not as regularly as I did when I was in the Middle East because they are hard to find here. Um, and although a breakfast meal, I do sometimes enjoy bacon and egg at 6 p.m. at night. So alcohol used to be wine or beer. Uh, I can't remember the last time I drank beer. Um, it's still only one or two, occasionally three glasses of red wine at night, only on the weekend, and then normally only one night per week. So my overall feeling with regard to energy, I think I'm still gonna have to say it's high and steady. It's pretty much always been high. Sometimes it's higher than normal, but I think generally over the three months, it's been high and steady, fairly consistent. So moving on to napping, no napping at all. If you are subscribed, you'll know that in the community tab, I quite regularly post my sleep scores for all to see. Motivation, you can see here I've changed this to motivation and attitude. And in the coming months, I'm gonna change that to just attitude. 
My motivation, like everybody's, does wax and wane to a certain degree, but it's my attitude that gets me up and gets me to the gym and also walking the dog for the full 30 minutes, even when it is pouring with tropical rain and she wants to head home too. Um, gym, gym performance, I'm still training Monday, Wednesday and Friday. Occasionally, and I'll talk about it later, I'd be missing a few gym sessions for factors that are outside of my control. Um, usually in the gym now between 40 and 50 minutes. And I ruck run on a Tuesday and Thursday. If I go alone, uh, I've usually done that by about 40 minutes. And again, if you are subscribed, I do post regularly my heart rate stats so you can see those in the community tab. I may be substituting my Thursday run for a longer bike ride. If I do do that, I'll tell you when and I'll tell you why. Injuries, none at all. I'm taking my time in the gym. I'm not really increasing any of the weight. I'm just doing um, a maintenance type um, schedule in the gym. Um, when I do ruck and run, I take my time with that also because I've still got that niggling injury in my right Achilles tendon. That happened after I, I don't know if I mentioned, I broke my leg playing rugby in 1988, kept me off the field for about eight months. Uh, and my right leg started carrying that. So I've got a, a dodgy um, knee and I've also got an Achilles tendon that does sometimes flare up. So although I'd like to push the pace, I have to slow down because although my right leg's got the metal plate in it, it's sorry, my left leg has got the metal plate in it. It's the right leg that tends to slow me down. So moving on to sickness, no sickness at all. That's it for my subjective stats. Let's take a look at my objective stats for this 57 month update. First of all, my weight. You can see here my weight is now 88.6 kilos, which is 195.4 pounds. That's up 1.7 kilograms, which is 3.7 pounds since the last test, but it's down 3.4 kilos, which is 7.5 pounds since I started this. My BMI is now 28.5, up 0.2 since the last check but down 1.5 since the start. My percentage body fat is now 24.60, so up 0.1 since the last check, but down 1.9 since the start. Moving on to muscle mass, you can see here that it's now 34.3. That's down 0.1 since the last check, and it's up 0.8 since the start. So not fantastic. I'd like to be putting on more muscle. Uh, it's important that we do that as we age. Um, but as long as I'm not losing a vast amount of muscle and heading towards sarcopenia territory, I'm very happy. Happy. My basal metabolic rate was 17.82. It's now 18.05, so up 12 since the last check. That's to be expected because I have increased in weight slightly. Visceral fat was 13 and is still 13. I think this is one of my major complaints with this biometric scale. I've been 13 now on the old visceral fat scale since October 2022. I can't believe that with my muscle mass and with my fat body fat percentage going up and down or whatever it's happened to it, this has stayed the same. Um, I wish that they had a decimal point after this because this could be 13.1 and this could be 13.9, which is which is terrible. Or this could be 13.9 and this could be 13.01, which would mean I'm moving in the right direction. But I don't know um, which way around this is. So I really do wish that these this particular metric on the biometric scale was far more accurate. Moving on to my waist score, you can see here it was 35 inches. It's still 35 inches, which is a bit perplexing because I've lost a certain amount, a very small amount of muscle mass, and I have increased a little bit of body fat. So I'm just wondering where that fat has been put on because it's not on my waist. I use exactly the same measuring tape. Um, <clears throat> and I don't breathe in one month and, and let it out the next month. It's it's just it's strange to me how that has not changed. Moving on to my sleep, you'll know that if you follow the um, if you have subscribed, I do regularly post my sleep scores. Um, that's for the the night before. You can look at this if you want. I'll scroll down slowly. You feel free to pause the video to look at any particular metric that you wish. So for the last quarter. You can see that in November, my average overall sleep was seven hours, 22. And I'm trying to get it between seven and eight hours because all the studies I've read say that the overall sleep should be somewhere between seven and eight hours. My light sleep, four hours, 51. My deep sleep, which is important, and I want that to be at least over one hour, is one hour and 31. And my REM sleep, which again, I want to be over an hour, was actually on the hour, one hour dead for the average. In December, the average was seven hours and 25, so good, between seven and eight. 
My light sleep, four hours 50. My average deep sleep, again, was one hour and 31, which is good, over an hour. This is well over an hour. And my REM sleep here, which I want to be over an hour, was one hour and three minutes, again, which is great. In January of 2024, my average overall sleep was seven hours and 27, so that's good. That's the longest it's been in the quarter. Um, my light sleep, four hours and 45. My deep sleep, one hour and 36, which is great. And my average REM sleep, which is up, which is one hour and five. So that's it for my sleep scores. Moving on to my rest and heart rate. You can see here that for November, my rest and heart rate was 60.6. For December, it was 60.5. And January was 60.25. That gives me, for the quarter, an average of 60.4. If you look at this resting heart rate chart here, you can see that someone who's between the age of 56 and 65, my average score still keeps me in the excellent range, which I'm more than happy with. Moving on to my grip strength, and this is the monitor I use for measuring my grip strength. You can see here that in January, the end of January, it was 111.8 pounds on my left hand and 114.0 on my right hand. Looking at this um, metric here, or looking at this graph here, you can see that for a man between the age of 55 and 59, more than 106.7 has me in the strong range, which is great. If you have a look up here to somewhere a man between the age of 50 and 54, anything more than 111.5 is um, classed as strong. If you look at these scores, 111.8 on my left hand has me as strong, and my right hand, 114, has me as strong. So technically on this particular graph, I'm, a strong, I'm in the strong range for a man between the age of 50 and 54, even though at present I'm 59. 59 now, 60 uh, in April. Well, I hope you found that interesting or informative, hopefully both. I made a couple of notes. I personally thought that these stats were going to be a lot worse. This period covered for me three birthdays, Christmas and the New Year, which in the Philippines all revolve around food in excess to a certain degree um, and also staying up late. There were also two specific vet appointments um, that clash with ruck run days and I couldn't get around those. Um, and there's two specific projects that I'm working on at the moment that really have diverted my attention, but things that I'm going to cover more in detail on the channel because they are to do with my longevity experiment. Um, more about those in the coming weeks. And I hope you, um, you find them interesting uh, and as exciting as I do too.